quantum probability theory, quantum sample space, quantum event algebra. What does this all mean? John Harland will explain to me, to you, uh, how this relates to uh, the foundations of quantum physics and how this relates to the work that uh, the research that we are excited to do together when John visits me in Lithuania. John is a teacher at uh, Palomar College of Mathematics and Statistics, and he has a PhD in functional analysis. I am Andrus Kulikauskas. This is Math for Wisdom. We talked about an event algebra taking, you know, a set of subspaces and all the sums and intersections, you know, to form a larger collection of subspaces, which would then be our event algebra does not, that event algebra does not satisfy De Morgan's uh, theorem, uh, De Morgan's law, and therefore is not a Boolean algebra. And um, and alternatively, you can think of this not in terms of the actual subspaces, but the orthogonal projections onto those subspaces. And in general, you get a non-commutative set of ortho of projections. Um, but you know, this was sort of proposed early on for being the difference between quantum mechanics and classical mechanics. But it turns out that it's sort of too useful, it's too general to really be useful. And it really doesn't strike to the heart of how all this formalism is used to make sense of quantum measurements. So instead, I'm going to say usually perhaps this is always <laughs> you know there's schools of thought on this stuff and the schools of thought that I gravitate toward would be always you always choose or have or derive a uh, a set of basic outcomes I should say another set of outcomes or basic events to use consistent language um, E1 E2 and so forth these are closed subspaces. With the Hilbert space H. Satisfying um, they're mutually orthogonal. And therefore, their intersection is, is just the zero subspace, and they sum their direct sum when you sum up these subspaces. Now, we use this kind of uh, funny plus sign here indicating orthogonal. You know, we're summing up orthogonal subspaces, but this is no different than just summing up any old subspaces, um, is equal to the entire. Hilbert space. And sometimes I write this as just more compactly. Like that. Mm -hmm. And so this can be like a spin states, like spin up, spin down. Yes. And it can be like uh, Hermite functions where let's say you have a quantum harmonic oscillator and then you have all these uh, 
states uh, yes. going up and up and up, right? Like, well, yeah, there would be the, uh, in the, in the case of the Hermite uh, polynomials, you're talking about eigenstates of the Hamiltonian with a, with a Hermite, you know, Hermite oscillator Hamiltonian. And then uh, you could have combinations and, of these. And then, but these and are then those, would be, those would be one-dimensional. Would be one-dimensional in that case uh, because there's no degeneracy. There would be there would just be one-dimensional eigenstates, and um, and uh, sometimes um, you take the these these those would be one-dimensional eigenspaces, uh, one-dimensional mm -hmm. projections. Um, but they can add up to an infinite dimensional Hilbert space, right? There can be infinitely many. That's right. That's okay. right. And so sometimes these are one dimensional spaces, mm -hmm. sometimes they're multiple dimensional spaces, taking into account the degeneracy of the Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. uh, the um, degeneracy of the eigenstates of the Hamiltonian. Sometimes they're, you know, like combinations of those. You know, it's like, at, as we'll find out. Uh, when it comes to measurement of position, it's really combinations of, of basic eigenstates that we're interested in. Sometimes, or sometimes we might actually be cons considering one-dimensional, uh, one-dimensional uh, subspaces. Um, let's say equivalently. Let, let's get right down to it. Look what the uh, projection picture looks like so equivalently um you have um projections orthogonal projections and all of our projections in this discussion are going to be orthogonal projections uh, P E one, P E two, and so forth, such that one, uh, P E one, P E two, uh, which is equal to P E two, P E one, is equal to the projection onto the zero subspace. They're non overlapping projections, and two, they add up to the identity on the Hilbert space. So, in general, there could be projections that don't commute, but these projections always commute because they're basically. Yes, yes, they do. So, you don't get this situation of non commuting projections. In general, you know, when you set this up with just arbitrary subspaces, you can get non-commuting projections. For example, projection onto spin up on the x direction, projection onto spin up in the in the z direction would not mm -hmm. commute. Here, and this is only looking at like projection spin up on the x direction, spin down on the x direction. And then this disjointness then all, all of a sudden uh, speaks to De Morgan's uh, law that you were yes, uh, yes, about, so. Right? That, that, it's not a fundamentally a problem on this level. There's it's not. It is not a problem. All of our we're going to form an event algebra, and by taking sums of these projections, arbitrary sums of these projections, and they will all commute because the atomic projections commute. And then, then another thing that this all speaks to is a, a sense of definiteness. Like these are very definite, uh, and uh, they. So ontologically, like, you know, they're, they're well-defined. Um, they can exist on their own. Um, yeah, and, and also, it also, um, it also speaks to experimental compatibility. For example, these could be projections onto, or you can divide up the, the uh, position space into disjoint blobs, and these could be projections mm -hmm. on those blobs of position space, which we're going to do. Or you can divide up momentum space into disjoint blobs, you know, projections onto those and those and, and our position projectors will not commute with our momentum projectors and therefore they're sort of incompatible frameworks incompatible measurement frameworks mm -hmm. so uh so that's where like the the idea of consistency in quantum mechanics can be founded like on you either have a you have a you have an experimental frame, framework 
which has these uh, these projections, which are a resolution of the identity. I should say that here. That's what that's called when you sum up, mm -hmm. when you have mm -hmm. some, and actually this, I believe this right here, this whole thing is called a resolution of the identity. So the projections can be a resolution of the identity uh, in one, uh, one set of projections and a resolution of the identity in another set of projections, but those projections are non-commuting that the sets of projections are non commuting and therefore those are incompatible measurement frameworks. Mm. And that's where, uh, you know, I, I showed you that book, Consistent Quantum Mechanics. That's sort of the, the fundamental concept in that book. You can have, uh, you know, so what it means is that, you know, once you set up a measurement framework in quantum mechanics, um, you got to stick with it. And then if mm. you throw in stuff, if you say, okay, so let's spin up in the Y direction, which the con consistent theorists would say, you can't do that. That's not, that's a projection that doesn't commute with my uh, quantum event algebra. And therefore we can't even speak of that, of, of that outcome. And so um, these resolutions of identity just, um bring to mind the divisions of everything, you know, that I keep talking about. Of course, these can go on to infinity, these divisions of everything like free will and faith and so are like taking a stand, flying through, reflecting. Those in their own way are kind of like carving up the space uh, in in this definite way. Um, uh, and then um, I guess to add like this, this is this groundwork, this framework um, that you're telling us speaks to the idea that the intuition that we have in life and in physics on what is definite, you know, the things are definitely a certain way, so to speak, that's coded into this. Like, I mean, that's kind of saying our intuition is somehow meaningful, but maybe not always. But in this under, you know, basement level, it is meaningful. Yeah. Um, yes, I think I think so. It's like carving up the possible well, in this case, measurement, you know, but um, the, co the, po the set of possibilities, a set of real possibilities on any given physical setup um, in, in, a, in a certain way. And then you're going to see reality with respect to that framework. You're going to measure reality with respect to that framework. And, and then someone else comes along and has a different framework and they measure reality with respect to that framework. Mm -hmm. And, um, and then and then you guys have to get together and talk about why you don't agree. You know, it, mm -hmm. it's 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 a bit like relativity theory, um, mm -hmm. but uh, without any particular way of translating. In other words, if you measure spin, spin. Well, uh, there is a way of translating. I'm sorry, um, there is a way of translating. If you if you want to measure things spin up or down on the x direction, I want to measure spin up or down on the z direction. We can do it. Um, and we come together and we, uh, I say, I got spin up. You say you got spin down, or I say, I got spin up and you say you got spin up. And we notice that our, our measurements are inconsistent, but there is a certain probabilistic correlation between our measurements. Mm. Now, in the case of orthogonal axes with spin one half, there will be no correlation, but if your axes are pretty much, you know, in line with mine, say 10 degrees out of, out of, um, uh, out of line with mine, we're going to we're going to agree a lot of the time. So what quantum mechanics can do is give you that probability setup. In other words, tell you how often your measurements are going to correlate with mine. So we can't say exactly how reality is going to translate, but we can at least put a probability overlay on it. So in in relativity theory, we have an exact way of of translating via the Lorentz transformation. In other words, your reality and my reality seem to be different, but they're really not, you know. Mm. And there's no probability involved in that. There's it's no just probability uh... involved. Whereas in quantum mechanics, there is this kind of probabilistic overlay. There is this um, that, you know, we and... can't translate, but only up to, you know, not 100%, but up to, up to certain correlations, you know, up to certain expected. So, so in this case, uh... What you're doing with this uh, resolution of identity, with these uh, definitions in terms of uh, 
basic um, events or or basic i guess i kind of forgot that right but um what you're doing is you're creating this uh, groundwork for consistency to be possible you know like so if somebody can make a commitment to be consistent yes and two people can do that independently that's the first thing it does but then like you're saying if they've been doing that and they've been doing that independently then they can try to connect and so they can build like a third reality based but it'll be based on probabilistic events like actual measurements on actual uh you know and you'll have to build you'll have to kind of like interpret a whole new thing drawing from that probability as opposed to just uh directly translating using some formula in relativity yes that's right that's right and um so you know a you know a pretty large amount of attention in quantum mechanics is devoted to that probabilistic framework and and actually translating you know like from one event algebra into another you know that's mm -hmm. where our, our spin equations come from if we uh, have you know we, we rotate our axes of of, of um measurement um it's kind of where you know transition you know like a like um you know, our, um, oh, I want to say, um, you know, the matrices that we use in quantum mechanics that will, will, uh, translate like if you're in a certain state, what's the probability of measuring in another state? So, uh, it's going to be density matrix or, a, or just a, a, a Hamiltonian will, will give you that information. So a lot of it is, you know, kind of like our, our attention is directed toward that. Like if I prepare a system in a certain state and I measure it uh, in, a, in, in, a, in a set of incompatible states, you know, what's the probability of, of landing in each of those incompatible states? And, you know, that's very important consideration in quantum mechanics because often our measurements are of that, are of that form. We prepare in a certain state, we measure in a different framework and so i'm not going to say that incompatible frameworks don't come up you know because they come up all the time you prepare in one state and you measure in a different framework um but um so in effect if you could always prepare in a certain framework and measure in the same framework then there would be no probability stuff in quantum mechanics. It would just be like, mm -hmm. oh, if you prepare, prepare in a certain state, you're going to measure in a certain state. So if you if you always prepared a particle and spin up with respect to the x-axis, and you always measured and spin up or spin down with respect to the x-axis, there would be no need for probability. Once you're prepared and spin up and you don't perturb it, you know, forever is going to be in spin up. If you measure a particle in a certain region of space and and you somehow can stop it and keep it from evolving and keep it from being perturbed by anything else, it's gonna sit there, you know, like a like a like a uh, some kind of ion in a in an electromagnetic trap. It's just sitting there vibrating in a potential well, you know, and you're gonna measure it there and then later you'll come back and it'll be there as long as you don't knock it out of there, you know. So in a sense, quantum mechanics is not intrinsically probabilistic. It's not like nature, it's not like, you know, nature is just all over the place. It's it's really the probabilistic part of it comes up when you prepare in a certain state and you measure in a in a framework that's incompatible with, with uh, the particular state that you prepared it in. And now you might prepare it in a super busy. Yeah, you know, I mean, look, it it we'll we'll get we'll get into it later, like this interpretation. But it turns out that there is a lot swept under the rug in 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 this particular sphere of ideas, and we'll get to it. And there's some a little bit of disturbing inflation going on, I think, even in very careful treatments of quantum mechanics. Like, what's the difference between probabilistic the this probabilistic framework that we're about to build based on preparing in one state and then observing in a in an incompatible framework and and just regular ensemble uh kind of probabilistic stuff where you don't quite know what state you're preparing it in and therefore there's a whole smear of possible mm -hmm. experimental outcomes there's some conflation going on there and 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 I think even very careful treatments of quantum mechanics 
And, and I think you and I uh, really need to dig into that because mm -hmm. okay, I, I think it's fundamental. And I think that, you know, we will, you will, we'll, we'll, so that's why this set of lectures or not lectures, but discussions may go on you know, as we, as mm -hmm. in Lithuania, we might want to keep on discussing this stuff because I'm a little bit disturbed as we go along and I want to, I want to work through those, you know, I, I want us to be, you know, um, I want us to kind of dig into those things to make sure that we don't miss something. Um, and so, and so I'll uh, share my mistake in thinking because that's one way to, for me to learn, but also uh, maybe something will um, pop up probabilistically. And so the thinking that comes to me as you describe this is that uh, when you have two different um, frameworks, you know, of consistency, let's say, and you start to do these experiments that you can, um, well, they'd give probabilistic results. But there's a sense that uh, those probabilistic results are contributing to a, and kind of like uh, being, they're constructing a third point of view, like that's kind of making sense of what it's seen. You know, like that there's some kind of like third vantage point. It's not like that the first or the second are... Um, it's more like that there's they're creating a whole new look at what's going on. That's the sense that I get. I don't know if that, that's on track. Uh, yeah, and that third look at going on, uh, of what's going on could be a deeper dynamical theory. For example, David Bohm's mm -hmm. you know, pilot wave theory or perhaps the perhaps the uh, many worlds theory, spontaneous collapse, whatever. Um, you know, these are different theories of making sense, but these are deeper theories. These are the third point of view. They're the, they're the, uh, they're the point of view that says that there is some deeper dynamical thing going on, or, you know, like what I've been thinking about, like some third point of view that would involve some perhaps extra dynamical thinking. Um, and, and what, and to make me maybe try to be a little bit more precise on my end, like when I think of this clash, it, and I also kind of think of it in terms of languages. So like we have in the quantum world, our language becomes very limited. Like you can say yes or no. You can say spin up or spin down. And if you're asked like, well, what about this? The answer you give is either yes or no. You know, although the the question was 45 degrees and you just have to say yes. And, may, and then you have to stick, be consistent with that. If you said yes to that question, you have to keep saying yes, let's say. Yeah. So you have this. Um, degenerate language, uh, you know, or insufficient language that you're forced to use to give these responses. And so there may be like a certain type of randomness involved um, just on that level generated. But the third look that's looking above is kind of like expecting randomness and trying to read from the randomness what is the underlying structure. It's kind of like a going the other way that's the way i kind of picture it but we'll see if that fails but yeah that's where I'm and, and ultimately you know um i think we're we are trying to step back and get that third that third eye in there and um and both of us are really con <laughs> really concerned about you know this kind of idea of agency i think um mm -hmm. and so i mean I would like to reach toward a, a a third point of view here that makes that explicit somehow that 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 creates and, and, hierarchy that creates that you know there's some kind of hierarchy and it doesn't it doesn't speak to whether everything's truly random or truly dynamical. I almost think that I almost think that those points of view. I almost think that. There's some theorem sitting out there that says that anything that you think is random can be given a dynamical explanation, or anything that's dynamical and complicated enough, you're perfectly fine in giving it a random, you know, explanation. Like in other words, mm -hmm. I have a feeling that those are that that could it's it's it's, not, it's almost like you can never resolve that. You could. I listened to a YouTube video, you know, about recent research, but it basically said uh, in the context of complexity theory, like, you know, exactly that, like, you know, that uh, when they somebody was able to prove that uh, although there's a lot of power, you know, to some of these random approaches, you know, where you have like a non-deterministic or random algorithms or whatever, but he was able to prove that 
actually within the context of complexity theory, you can always translate that into a uh, deterministic uh, non-random algorithm. So a lot of this is kind of very technical, and so I didn't understand it. Yeah. But the, that's yeah, that, that idea. The way, is... the way pseudo randomness works on a on well, on a non quantum computer, you know, a quantum computer is different, you know, <laughs> and may maybe truly random. I don't know, but um, pseudo randomness is always it's always deterministic. I mean, it, it's a Turing machine. Yeah, that's what they were talking about. Running a yes. freaking program. It's a deterministic <laughs> beast. It, it, and yes, you may have a seed that you get from the date or whatever. You, you may reach into nature and try to get a, a random seed. But, you know, there's only a finite number of possibilities of random seeds. It might be 10 to the 10 to the 10th to the 10th to the 10th. But it, it, you know, you start working in a finite dynamical system, you know, and it's a finite state machine. And therefore is not random, you know, very much not random. Um, and and so, so they were talking about that pseudo random, exactly like you're saying. Yeah. And then um, one theme that I just want to point out that we, we've thought that's entered our thinking is uh, that physics is really about pairs of frames. You know, that's when you start to talk about physics. If you're just in one frame, like it's kind of all, that's yeah. not really how physics is functioning. Physics is relating two frames where all these problems come up. And then when you have this third eye, it can be participating. It can, you know, on different levels at the same time, like it can belong. It has a role in one frame. It has the role in the other frame. It has the role in neither frame. It has a role in both frames, you know. So then it becomes very rich. Uh, and so the kind of thing you want with agency can be that richness can start to support that, I think. So, so let, let's, let's proceed here. Uh, you know, I, um, let's, so, okay. So these are the basic events or the basic outcomes. Um, and, you know, we haven't put a probability overlay on this yet, but we will. So, but let's talk about the event algebra. Basically, it's just going to be, you know, you take, you know, plus an intersection on basic events. Mm -hmm. So, you know, from the point of view of subspaces or the point of view of projections, again, these are isomorphic um isomorphic um frameworks so subspaces you just take you know the set of all you know so it's the, the event algebra i'm just going to call it e is equal to the set of all um you know unions uh no it wouldn't be unions no, no. it would be the set of all you know e i uh, you know the set of all sums you know actually you're going to have to i think we're going to have to be a little bit careful here uh you know you take a subsequence of, mm -hmm. of, the, of the index space and then you sum over those the set of all those now do we take intersections no the intersections would all be zero for those so you take the set of all of these where you know ki is a subsequence so it's actually quite straightforward because it's there's not that much that can happen you can that's only right be... yeah the intersections are all you know of the basic events are all and so they really are basic or atomic in this sense because uh, right. yeah. they have no internal structure from this point of view that's right um and the projections is just the set of all, of course, just the sums of projections. Uh, where again, ki is a subsequence. Of the positive integers. So those are event algebra. Let me grab my notes so that I don't flounder around too much here. <laughs>
Okay. Okay. All right, and okay, so so and basically for and let, let's call I don't know one of these maybe we just call it E and E prime they're really really kind of coding the same thing but you know so what what does it mean to say that you know E one you know, event, you know, those are basic events. Um, so I want to say like, if, you know, F uh, one, F two are in our event algebra, um, what does F one or F two means? Really means just F1 plus F2, we can, and F1 and F2 just means the intersection of these subspaces. Now, these are not basic events anymore, so there might be some non-trivial intersection. And, so, and F1 plus F2 is different than F1 union F2. Yeah, you know, F1 union F2 may not be a subspace, right? I mean, think about... Um, Think about you know two orthogonal uh, simple subspaces and take their union. Uh, it's not going to include things that are in their span, right? I mean, you really want to take the span of the two subspaces. So it's a. Oh, I see. So F one plus F two. Oh, so that now yeah. I'm starting to understand. It's because you're not dealing with these as sets. You're dealing with these as spaces, like you were saying. Yeah. Right. Like that's right. the point. So you need things to span. So it's not enough just to collect them. Right. And so De Morgan's law, it is true that if you take F1 or F2 and you intersect it with F3, it is equal to F1 intersect F3 plus F2 intersect F3. This is true. And now just so, <laughs> so that so it's like it's like it's not it's not a different thing than normal probability. It, it you do actually get a, a Boolean algebra, the event algebra. And so let me let me go back and understand uh, what we're actually saying here. So F one is what F one is a F one is just an event. Yeah, it's a it's an event in the event algebra. So it's a sum of basic events. It's a sum. It's a it's a span of basic subspaces. Well, uh, I see. It's a sequence, or so to speak, right? Like F one is a sequence. No, in, it's, of... so it's a span. Uh, this this this. So span the subspaces. So it's a span of like we take a bunch of subspaces that are basic that are right. Um, but it's like know. a subsequence of. I mean, it's it's so it's yeah. It's a it's a sum of a bunch of uh, basic of a, sub, uh, of a subsequence of basic bases, yeah. right? Like so. Yeah. So so yeah. It turns out then, yeah. Mm -hmm. I guess maybe maybe then just to kind of reload my mind. When you say E sub one, let's say, right? E sub one is a set, you said, right? No, E sub one is a subspace. Oh, a it's a subspace. space. Yeah. I see. It's Those a are... space of Hilbert in Hilbert space. It's a subspace. It's a close. Yeah. This is what this is what's not been registering with me. These are not like uh, sets and so, you know, I keep thinking about like measure spaces where like measure spaces are built from sets, but this is not measure spaces. These are well, algebras. Well, They're built. Spaces. Because we're going to see that if we choose, we can 
you know there is a close relationship um it looks with, similar but just to yeah. just to go so to these are, in a special case in a special case it is really a set of points in configuration space that's so a particular way of forming these subspaces and we're gonna we're gonna see that with the measurement of position that, okay but so f1 and f2 are built up they are subspaces which are built up from the basic uh, events the basic spaces that's right right and then in that context so mm -hmm. then if you add them you're getting a new space that spans them and then the crucial thing also is that like f1 f2 they all contain zero so Oh yeah. That's why or so that's why the or, you know, is just uh clear. Right? And then okay, so now like if you have a combination of these spaces and then you intersect with F3, then that'll be the same as as uh intersecting with the one and the other and then having that span. Okay, yeah. so I agree with that. Okay. Thank you. So and then you know, if you look at it over on the projection side, um it, it's very similar, you know, if you have the F1 projection onto F1, P projection onto F2. Uh, in the uh, projection event algebra, you know, or means, you know, means, you know, P F1 plus P F2. Now, now we have to be a little bit careful with projections. If there's some overlap there, if there's no overlap, then you just add them. If there is an overlap, you have to subtract off the, um, because you've added, when you add them up, you're adding that overlap. They're like twice. Indicator, to, these are like indicator functions. Is that right? Or? That's right. Kind of like, okay. just like in, in effect, these projections, when you're, when you divide up your basic configuration space, you know, you're, uh, you know, uh, into different disjoint cells, it is exactly inter indicator functions. As we're going to see for measurement or position, these project, these projections are in fact just multiplication by an indicator function. So, and in, in, and in particular, you have to uh, worry about like zero, right? Because zero is in all these spaces. So you have to, um, you have to deal with that what you're dealing with yeah zero is always in there so um so it turns out you know when you want to when you want to get the end all you do is multiply these projectors so mm -hmm. you know, the projectors or the projections physicists call them projectors mathematicians call this projection It's a commuting set mm -hmm. of projections. So all the projections in this uh, event algebra commute. So it's a commuting algebra. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> okay, so, so now that we're in the, this particular case of choosing a uh, resolution of the identity, we no longer see these artifacts of having a non boolean algebra. Okay, so now we're going to, so this is, so again, you know, the upshot is that, you know, the event algebra, or equivalently E prime, uh, form our measurement formalism. And again, we're going to circle back to like classical mechanics and like figure out, you know, in what sense is this a generalization of of what's happening in classical mechanics? It turns out that classical mechanics can be embedded in this formalism, but it turns out that this is more general. Um, so to complete this, to um, is to to link up. The dynamical uh, 
the measurement part of quantum mechanics. Uh, so we need this idea of a quantum probability function. So let's talk about this. Okay, so the quantum probability function, I'm going to call it, you know, prob. You know, P, we have P for projection, P for probability. So, you know, it's better just using a phrase here. This goes from the event algebra into, it's a function from the event algebra into the interval zero to one, such that, first of all, the probability of the zero subspace is just zero. The probability of the entire Hilbert space is equal to one. And there's an additive property If you, have, you add up two orthogonal subspaces, the mm -hmm. probability of the sum of the you know linear the linear sum of those two orthogonal subspaces is the sum of the independent of the separate probabilities. And I don't know if you need other but it, would it be true that the probability of f1 plus f2 would be the probability of uh each minus the probability of the no I, don't I guess so. there's, that's not true right i don't believe so okay no. and you have partly because commutativity yeah, yeah. come into play right like you know so f1 f2 may not generally be equal to f2 f1 right well, F1 plus F2 is equal to F2 plus F1. Yes, definitely. But F1 times F2. Oh, well, you, well, you mean it's, F1 times F2 doesn't make sense. You mean they're projections? Because, um, yes, they're, these are commutative. Oh, I'm sorry. This is yeah, the in events. This, in this framework, so in this event down, it's the atomic events. These are spaces, right. Yeah, the, the atomic events are all mutually orthogonal, and they're, they have no overlap, and then yes, you get a you get a you get a completely commutative event algebra. <clears throat> but then you can define you can define the intersection of f one f two right like oh, yeah. yeah the intersection so the idea that the probability of f one plus f two equals the sum minus the inter the probability of the intersection is that true or not true in general? Um. Let's leave that as a question. You know, I okay. I, 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 okay, I, good. I have to think about that. Um, okay, it seems like I would because because um, it would be strange if it was one the, because the probability of f one plus f two is really the probability of you know f one minus f two plus f two, right? I I mean we have to we have to work that out. Let let's let's mm -hmm. let's leave that. For example, you know the probability. See, this might be an actual theorem that the probability of F1 plus F2, it might be deducible from the other two, from the other mm -hmm. the ones above. Mm -hmm. I think this is true. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think it is because mm -hmm. we'll think about this. Yeah. So the, this is the theorem. It's just okay, a, good. Yeah, I think so. Um, 
So let's just write thus. Uh, I don't know what's happening with my pen here. So on vacation. And this probably is a consequence of being able to write out any fi in terms of uh, basic events. Right. Yeah, you could write it out that way, or you can write out the, I mean, the orthogonal complement of f1 mm -hmm. of F within f1, and then write f1 as a direct sum, you know, orthogonal mm -hmm. sum. And okay, that's more. Plus it's orthogonal complement and so forth. You know, you can, there's lots of ways of, I think, proving this, but I think it is true. So let's call this thus. So it's not, let's call this theorem. But yeah, it's a good observation. So um, let's, um, so how do we construct do these exist? For, you know, I mean, does does such a does such a function even mm -hmm. exist, or how do you construct them? Well, let's call it quantum probability functions, although that's not standard language. So one way, in the generic way in quantum mechanics, <clears throat> um, is to fix uh, a vector in the Hilbert space. And write this probability function based on this vector of an event f in the event algebra is just equal to the projection onto E of this vector psi, mm -hmm. and you take its magnitude squared. This is sort of the general um, construction that we'll call the Born rule. In other words, given a vector, oh, and I, I should say this vector has to be unit length. Otherwise, we're not going to get a probability. We better make sure that it's normalized. Now, later we're going to associate this with a wave function, but you know, it's really important to understand that this is not the only way of constructing probability measures. And so just frag me and understand this. So F is any event which could be composed by uh, uh, these basic events, right? Right. And we're trying to get the probability. And again, this probability function. And the value of... Yep. Define. Okay. Sorry, I should say define. Let me, let me just make this explicit. We're going to define probability... Okay sub psi from the event algebra into zero one as follows. So we're actually defining a probability function here. Uh, and now, like you said, uh, psi, I was a little bit confused. I thought it was a function, but it's not a function. It is a uh, space. No, psi, it psi is just a, a fixed vector in the Hilbert space. Oh, it's just a fixed vector. It's not even a space. It's a fixed vector. Yeah. And we can, given that fixed vector, we can construct a probability function on the event algebra, on any event algebra. Oh, because it has norm one. Yeah. So it is, so, you know, if, if, if for my mind, like how to understand that is to say, well, if the total norm is one, then yes. if you look at it on all the different uh, subspaces for the basic events, <clears> then that break it up and they're all orthogonal even too yeah. so okay and then you're and so, why, and so why do we need square you know need why not just the norm the norm squared 
um, to satisfy property three. What does property three say? If we have orthogonal subspaces, then the probabilities have to add. So the only way that these things would add via the Pythagorean theorem is for you to use squares, right? So this is coming from the Pythagorean theorem, how, yeah. how things add, okay, geometrically. That's right. Norms, the squares of norms add, as long as those norms are taken against, against orthogonal subspaces. Their norms don't add, the squares of the norms add by the Pythagorean theorem. And that's, um, that speaks in my mind like to this idea that this is really geometric, right? If it's the geometry of this that, you know, is kind of like uh, giving us the Pythagorean theorem and the... Yeah. And the geometry is coming from the, you know, it's expressing the orthogonality basically, right? So... Yeah. Yeah, there's some geometric Hilbert space stuff going on here. More generally, you can take a convex combination of these probability mm -hmm. methods. So if this isn't the only way of constructing these probability measures, it's important to note that, you know, convex combinations. And then the question is, like, are all probability measures, you know, what, what is the what is the theory of mathematical uh you know, uh, fundamentals of, you know, constructing these probability measures. And the answer is quite complicated. Uh, there is a, there is a paper I kind of picked up about this and, um, you know, I would, I would hope that these were, you know, the convex combinations of these things would give you every single probability measure. But according to this paper, that is not the case. And so, so what is a convex combination? Convex combination just means you, uh, add these probability measures with positive weight or non-negative weights that add up to one. That's okay. what a combination is. Um, so, yeah, it's like uh, there's this not the only this is the quantum mechanical way of constructing these probability measures, but it's not the only mathematical way. There's there's in general uh, you know a whole theory of probability measures like this that is quite you know, quite elaborate and relates to um, relates to some very interesting stuff and analysis. I think it's an interesting mathematical question, whether it's a practical question within quantum mechanics, I don't know. I'm not sure that, you know, that physicists are necessarily interested in any other kinds of probability measures, but we should keep that in mind, right? It's possible that- there Well, be... and it's, it's the kind of thing like if, it depends on nature, like, you know, nature maybe has a, has a uh, you know room for that like in its uh vocabulary but maybe it doesn't so well in a sense you know what i've been thinking of with this with this calling is mm -hmm. it might have two simultaneous dyna dynamical systems one that kind of comes from the classical uh more, more related to classical and the other is quantum and then they are in conflict you know it's like you have a problem mm -hmm. and they're kind of in conflict and there's some kind of tug of war um some kind of selection process so Maybe you know that's a way of thinking about this this upper triangular thing that I've been talking about. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, in other words, there there are two relevant dynamical systems at any given time, and and um, so, but this formalism does not preclude that there could be multiple relevant dynamical systems with a consistent probability. Uh, uh, underlying probability um, framework 
that includes all of them by some convex combination or some other kind of combination of, you know, like maybe there's two relevant or ways. No Five. combination. I mean, it may, there may be something that simply isn't um, describable right. in terms of combinations, right? Like it's just... Right. A... Mm -hmm. So, okay, so there's that. So typically in quantum mechanics, the Born rule, and I don't know of any other examples in quantum mechanics where we're not using the Born rule. So that's maybe Thomas knows more about this than we do, but maybe we can ask him. Um, so let's... Uh, <clears throat> All right. So let's talk about uh, measurables. Or observable. Uh, or just the results of a measurement. So the basic outcomes or sometimes people call these properties um, you know there's advantages and disadvantages to all this vocabulary calling it properties are the basic events E1, E2 and so forth these are you know usually orthogonal projections that add up to the identity um, and so a quantum random variable is a function that goes from the set of events into the real numbers, i.e. it's a function which assigns a number lambda i to each outcome EI. It's exactly the same definition of a random variable in probability theory. You have a basic set of outcomes and you assign to each outcome a number. And so essentially you're, you know, uh, are you measuring that, you know, in this framework, are you measuring the outcome? No, you're, you're measuring that number associated with that outcome. So, you know, there's six sides of a die, the number could be the number of dots on each of those six sides. The sides of the die are the outcomes, the number of dots is the random variable. In other words, it's a mapping from each outcome to the set one to six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so let's... Uh, Let's kind of unpack this a little bit. Um, so, um, let's just call it. I mean, we need an we uh, let instead of calling it f a function let's call it let's give it a num let's give it a name uh let's just call it a g for right now so it's a function g that goes from g of e i is equal to some real number lambda i and let's ask what is the average value Mm -hmm. 
or expected. Value of G. <clears throat> well, given a probability measure, that's easy to define, right? It's going to be the average value of G. I'm just going to write a bar in front of it. It's just going to be, well, it's going to be these lambda I's just weighted by the probabilities of these mm -hmm. outcomes. It's just going to be, I and mean, there's only one way to really define this, and that's the probability of E I. Okay. So this is just straight up probability theory, right? So let's kind of unpack this a little bit. Let's um, G is actually equal to and I'd like to do it. I, I want to kind of do it in this. Okay, so let's let's write this out. Note for um, probability um, of EI equal the projection onto, I'm sorry, projection onto EI of some fixed vector. In other words, if we're assuming the Born rule in terms of the construction of this probability measure, Let's write out what this means. This means lambda i times the projection onto e i. And I think this is going to be really illuminating. I think that we are not going to we are not going to connect to self adjoint operators, but just sort of in a natural way. In other words, we're going to unpack this sum here in a certain way. So watch what happens. What is it? What is a norm of a of a vector? The norm of the vector is just the inner product of the vector, or the square of the norm is the inner product of the vector with itself. The projection So are we good? Yeah. Okay. Now this is a self adjoint operator. Oh, I should mention. I should mention that uh, orthogonal projections are self-adjoint. Uh, I should have mentioned that up here. Did I mention that? I might have mentioned it up here. I don't think so. No. Mm -mm. Eh, shit. Let's see. Yeah, I did. Self-adjoint. Oh, Orthog okay. So orthogonal projections. That's why we talk about. I mean, I mean. Who says that non-orthogonal projections aren't relevant, but maybe they are. But in this basic setup, we're talking about only orthogonal projections. And just so remind me, so you said P squared equals P. That's one of the things, right? And the other is? P squared. So it's a projection, but it's orthogonal in the sense that it's self-adjoint. And we could work through that if you want to, if you, you know, if you believe oh, that, that. This is mean uh, P star of E sub I. It's adjoint is equal to itself. So these two statements are equivalent to being a orthogonal projection. But w can you write down the adjoint again, just because I don't remember. Or, or go up back to this. The adjoint, you know, the adjoint of any operator. Okay. Okay, so the inner product of of p psi comma phi will be the inner product of psi comma p phi. Okay. Yeah. So now watch what happens here. This is kind of the magic of project of orthogonal projections. You can bring this over, right? Mm -hmm. Because of this adjoint property. Well, bring it to adjoint over. You can do that with any, you can always bring it adjoint over. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. That's, it's because it's it, 
Yeah, okay. because uh, definition of adjoint. So P P I squared. I'm sorry, we're getting ahead of ourselves. I'm going to leave out the parentheses, which is common in linear linear functions. Leave out parentheses. So um, let's keep on going here. Well, check this out. This is just this is just the same thing as P E I times P E I because the adjoint is the same as the original thing, but that's P E I mm -hmm. squared. And so that's just P E I. Mm. So this is a very, so this is a very common thing that the operator here is just, will write down without even going through these steps that um, you, the whole thing just collapses into this. Mm. All right. And now the sum can be brought inside Like that? Mm -hmm. Okay. And this is equal to, we're just going to call this, it's just a single operator. Where T is just equal to this weighted sum of projections. So I've just written it in a very collapsed fashion here. And I'm going to call that operator T sub G because see, mm -hmm. it's related to, it's intimately connected with G, which is the thing that assigns to each subspace a number lambda I, which is a real number. Okay. And so that's the average value of? Yeah, that's the average. And this is this is our result here. The average value can be written as this simple, this simple um, expression in terms of this operator TGI. This is a weighted sum of projections. OK. OK. Now, all we've done is just a bunch of uh, symbol pushing, right? I mean, we haven't changed anything right. from, you know, this basic, you know, all we've done is rewritten this. You might think, well, you know, why would you do that? Mm -hmm. And here's, here's the clincher here, a weighted sum of projections. So that reminds someone of something in, a, in particular. It was von Neumann who kind of recognized this. And he was one of the authors of the various versions of the spectral theorem. <clears throat> Every self adjoint operator is the weighted sum of projections. And vice versa. That is there exists a resolution of the identity. such that T is equal to this weighted sum of projections. More generally, you know, this is for a discrete spectrum. The lambda I are called the spectrum. Mm -hmm. This is for a discrete spectrum.
but you can also have continuous spectrum. Looks like this, the, the most general statement of the spectral theorem. Uh, this is called a spectral measure. Which is a projection value measure. Mm -hmm. So I think Reitz and Hilbert um, proved this for discrete spectrum in the maybe 1890s, early 1900s. And then this came from von Neumann and other people a little bit later mm -hmm. for continuous spectrum. But, you know, basically it's the same thing. You know, if you have a discrete spectrum, I mean, this is. This is the more general statement. And and this speaks to the geometry of Hilbert space, of this orthogonality. Yeah. That's that's what this is expressing, basically. Right. I think. Mm -hmm. So why are self-adjoint operators occur in in Hilbert in in, a, in quantum mechanics? It's because of the formalism, you know. Uh, dividing the space up into these, um, you know, a direct, you know, a direct sum of of smaller subspaces, and then assigning a number to each smaller subspace is exactly what you do when you choose a self adjoint operator. That's exactly the situation where the measurables correspond to self adjoint operators. And how do they correspond to self adjoint operators in this sort of abstract way? It's not like, oh well, you know. This is some kind of like magic thing. No, it's like this is a formalism that if you do this magic thing, you end up with the Born rule. And why is it? Because just reverse the steps. It's just exactly that. It's just that's what connects with the probability theory. It's just a nice compact formalism for connecting with the probability theory. In other words, this is really just an abstract construct. The self adjoint operator, but it gives you nice ways of doing computations of probabilities. And and maybe just to uh, try to restate it in my mind, but what you've done um, is instead of having a probability theory based on sets, you're doing something very analogous, but it's a probability theory based on uh, atomic subspaces of this potentially like, you know, infinite dimensional Hilbert space. And in this case, what you get from the Hilbert space is you get this notion of the norm and you get this notion of the orthogonality, this relationship basically dating back to Pythagoras between these atomic subspaces, these dimensions, so to speak. Yeah. And so probability gets expressed in that type of geometrical logic. And then once you have that whole logical thing, then it's saying, well, uh, doing the, you know, so the Born rule will be just the probability that you get from um, the square notion of that. And then this whole breakdown uh, that you would typically get for a probability um, uh, function uh, is going to hook into these self-adjoint operators uh, that, 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 that where they're, they're, saying basically that the orthogonality uh, makes sense coming from the left, coming from the right. It's the same thing. That's how I kind of process what you're saying. There's kind of a lot to process here, I think, you know, and I think that it's got a jar around your head a bit. It's, it is a formalism, mm -hmm. but let me, let me just emphasize, this is a specific kind of probability theory. Probability theory mm -hmm. is more general than this. Quantum probability theory is more specific than normal probability theory. Because right. we're, we're constructing the basic outcomes in a particular way from a, you know, from a, from a Hilbert space and taking orthogonal subspaces of that Hilbert space. So that's a particular set of outcomes. It's a, a normal probability theory that outcomes can be, you know, they're just, it's set theory basically. And so set theory is way more general than, than what we're doing. Well, here. it's much more, um, it's much more flexible, much less structured. So here you have a very structured environment. Um, yeah. Where you have this notion, we have this norm, and you have these dimensions, you have this orthogonality, things are all broken up in a very, you know, clear way, which is the under underlying kind of like thing. And so, I will 
argue, I will argue um, as we're going forward that this is more general than the classical probability theory, you know, that you normally get. In other words, it's mm -hmm. more flexible to allow us for mm -hmm. a larger set of subspace considerations and a larger set of what it means, you know, what, what these size mean, you know, what, what this what this magic vector means. But all this all this will uh, be an overlay not only for classical, but for not only for quantum, but for classical. Um, well, so it's, I guess maybe there's two ways to think of this. One is to say you have the normal, you know, or the usual probability theory with sets, and then you've added this structure, which kind of makes it less right. flexible. Kind that's of. Right. But the opposite is to say, oh no, what we've done is we've enriched, you know, so like instead of just having a point that's kind of trivial, these, you know, these, uh, elements of sets that are trivial no no they're going to be thought of as uh spaces right mm -hmm. so they're enriched and so now these points don't have trivial relationships they're now that you can span them let's say with uh you know and such you can have addition or you can have yeah it's it's, it's a weird kind of circular thing and and maybe we should give some credence to that thought that you know you start off with a set of outcomes and then you look at the Oh, you know, you look at these as being atoms and, you know, like a, like a atomic subspaces, you know, and so you put some structure on that set and all of a sudden you're now in some linear structure. Now you could talk mm -hmm. about, you know, probability theory based on, based on, you know, this kind of quantum thing. And then, and then, so maybe that's more general than just looking at the, uh, the, the outcomes being individual atoms. But in fact, we are back to probability theory because the outcomes are just points in a space. They're, they're, the points happen to be in a projective, uh, in a projective space or they're subspaces of a over space. And so again, we're back to normal probability theory. So there's this weird kind of circular thing going on here. Well, and, and th with that circular thing, I just want to relate to the video we made uh, with you. And actually, we made a couple where you were talking about your uh, extra dynamical uh, evolutionary um, foundations for quantum physics that you're thinking through and working on. And you emphasized um, when in relating classical uh, physics and quantum physics, you emphasized the notion that, um, I can get this right. I mean, I think it's these two directions. So like one direction is basically saying, well, we can um, add we can make more presumption, like, let's say, you know, I guess we can add structure so we can, we can make, and it's a little bit also like with this bot periodicity that I'm looking at, like where you add an operator. So you're adding structure, but on the other hand, um, and so you're kind of like dealing with fewer cases, you're breaking symmetry, so <laughs> to speak, uh, you're yeah. dealing with a more specific, special, particular environment, but then you can go back and say, oh, no, no, these spaces now think of them as points and now think of them as like the building blocks for your theory right so you go back up to say like oh quantum you know you can think of quantum uh the world as a quantization as something more special <clears throat> you know more specialized but then you can go back up and say no no quantums are the building blocks for the classical and so just similarly like you can go back and forth yeah. uh, right right and this is why i wanted to talk to you about this because yeah this is precisely i think i think would this is precisely the thing i think that you're going to find useful when you connect bot periodicity to, mm -hmm. to the physical world like i think that this is central and so i think you're already, you're already seeing, you know so i mean um So anyway, you know, you know, where's the Born rule come from? It really is the way we construct our probability, um, the way we construct our probability functions in quantum mechanics, and it really is an axiom. Mm -hmm. It was an axiom. You know, it's not. It, you know, there's again, we decided that it's not the only way of constructing a probability function. There's a particular way in. And well, to, to say it's an axiom is basically like a shorthand to say we're going to think of this geometric way of looking at everything. Right. So maybe from that axiom, you could build up all the Hilbert space and yeah. et cetera. Maybe that's and, sufficient, you know, to that addition, that type of. Uh, but uh, but but really, it's not about 
that it's about the whole machine you know it, it's about the whole foundation you've given right which was yeah. the mineral so, foundation so for the born yeah so so it's uh you know i think it's really good to think about it is you know it it's an assumption and it's not the only probability measure that potentially makes sense in in the physical world so uh then the other thing is where do the where do self-adjoint operators come from they're they're just a compact way of of writing out averages of of quantum random variables and so you can think of them as being oh it's a fundamental thing or i don't think of them as being fundamental i think of them as being a uh, short count i you know just a it, it's a it's it's a nice compact representation of a of a quantum random variable and so you know there there is a little bit of a philosophical debate like what you know when we talked about the complex numbers you know we said oh it's really just two copies of the real numbers so why not just think of it that way but then you realize that or you know you represent waves as complex numbers and say oh is there something uh intrinsic about the complex numbers say so, you no know, it's just two copies of real numbers well yes and no right i mean because it makes the algebra so much simpler it kind of is intrinsic right i mean that's if there's anything that makes sense of the word intrinsic it's that right so in a sense then self-adjoint operators are intrinsic they encode <laughs> they encode random variables in a way that is intrinsic i would say you know you have a random variable and you know averages of the random variable, but it gets very nicely encoded in self-adjoint operators. So I think that there's no crime in thinking of self-adjoint operators as being intrinsic. You know, you know what I mean? Like, a, in a sense, you see where they come well, from. I, if, uh, I'm just uh, leaning on the spectral theorem that you wrote here, but that's a very profound uh, statement. It's saying that uh, <clears throat> it's saying that analogy between um, this uh, geometric probability of this Hilbert spaces with the let's say set spaces like that 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 here it's it's the weighted sum of projections so it's playing this uh, this fundamental role but the thing that strikes me is that um, it really seems to be an expression of the symmetry in the uh, norm you know that if you're reading the norm from left to right or right to left. Uh, you it's symmetric you know on some level so um that well, is what here. is driving this i think right yes of course the yeah i mean the self adjoint operator can be put over here too um because it's self adjoint you know so yeah there's a certain symmetry here that you're yeah i mean if you want to think of this as a you know property well like if, just if you look at the formula below like a psi phi and equal to psi you know comma a star phi like that there's this pair of operators either which you know you could be working with they're adjoint to each other but one is coming from the left the other is coming from the right and so it's almost like a you know inversion uh of the direction of uh you know the math basically yeah. And so there's a lot of these issues in the symmetry in math itself where like, you know, are you doing your symbols from left to right or are you reading them from right to left? And this is saying that uh, there's a symmetry, it doesn't matter. So that is what makes the whole point of, I mean, that's basically the definition of adjoint and that's what is must be lurking here. The fact that the inner product supports that type of thing because... Uh, the norm, the inner product on the Hilbert space is by design that type of um, that type of thing. I think, like if it wasn't like that, then this couldn't really hold uh, very well. I don't think. Well, you know, Hilbert space is essentially a Banach space with a symmetry. You know that that it's its own right. self. It's its own self dual. You know, and uh, and so that that they, these these self adjoint operators are basically the spirits of that symmetry. They're they're they they pass that symmetry test yeah dear viewer john and i talked further but we'll save that for another video
Thank you for watching this video. Please uh, go to mathforwisdom.com or simply read the description to this video to learn how you can join our Math for Wisdom discussion group and our study groups. Thank you for liking this video, for subscribing to this YouTube channel, and for supporting Math for Wisdom through Patreon. It takes five minutes. You go to Patreon. In the search box, you put Math for Wisdom. There you are. Couple minutes of filling out a few little things. Next thing you know, you're a Math for Wisdom Patreon supporter. It's that easy.